This vehicle here is something that's called a standard beaverette and the museum has just acquired it. The beaverette is one of those vehicles that was put together in the 1940 when it was really an emergency measure vehicle. Britain had lost an awful lot of its armour out in France after it comes back after Dunkirk and there's a number of ideas are put together to try and quickly come up with some form of an emergency armoured vehicle. Now, Lord Beaverbrook, who was a uh, publishing magnate in Britain, he started life as Max Aitken, um, he ends up being put in charge of aircraft production. And his idea is he goes to the standard car company and they have about 500 saloon car chassis sitting there. And he says, why don't you try and convert those into an armoured car? Now, the Mark I Beaverette is put together very quickly using a standard car, a 14 horsepower engine, standard car chassis, about 11 millimetres of armour plate on the front of the vehicle, some oak behind that to add to its level of protection, oak planks, and uh, basically a, an empty rear, so it wasn't armoured all the way around. Very quickly they come up with a second version of it where they managed to get armour plate around most of it. Um, the Mark III and the Mark IV are much better improvements, um, but that's not actually saying much. Everybody who seems to have drived one of these seems to indicate that it is ridiculously slow. It could only go at about 24 miles an hour, which isn't very fast at all. Um, the visibility from driving it, um, this Mark IV is supposed to be improved, but the driver only looks out of that one vision port and he's entirely surrounded around him, which is why pretty much all the models of the Beaverette, you had to have a co-driver with you who his key role is looking out for where the vehicle is going um, so it doesn't roll or come off the road. And there were some fatalities in these vehicles where someone goes around a corner too fast, it ended up rolling. Now with the Mark III and the Mark IV, they put a turret on and on that, they'd end up putting something like a, a Bren gun, sometimes a boy's anti-tank rifle, sometimes even a Vickers machine gun. Now, these vehicles, once they were made, about 2,800 uh, by about late 1942, um, they're issued out. The original aim is emergency defence, so home guard units, uh, airfield defence, so the RAF regiment takes them to look after airfields, but they're also issued to a number of army units, and because we've got such a paucity of armoured vehicles at that time, they end up using a lot of them, not just for training, but reconnaissance regiments, etc., are giving them. They don't actually go abroad. 1942, they're already realised that they're obsolete, not worth continuing with, and some of those vehicles, even as early as late 42, are sold on. Some are actually sold to the Irish Army um, as early as that. Um, after the war, some other ones, were, again, were gifted away to help recreate and help set up armories around the world. Now, this particular vehicle um, that we've got here, we've just acquired. Um, and again, people sometimes ask us, where do vehicles come from? Where do we acquire them? How do we get them? Now, the Tank Museum has something called a wants list. So we've put together um, not just one individual, but we have something called a collection committee, the great and the good sitting there. What we've done is agreed a list of key vehicles a museum would like. Now, we're never going to be able to achieve, collect absolutely everything in the armoured vehicle field. So sometimes we've gone for what we might call the parent, the most significant vehicle in a family. Sometimes we've acquired things with the idea that if we get a better or more significant example, we'll move the earlier example on. So in other words, we might be able to do swaps at certain times. And that list um, is something that we're actively pursuing some of those vehicles. We know one or two of them may take forever to appear. We know some of them, if they do still exist, are probably going to be vehicles that uh, are going to be in a terrible condition. There's some vehicles we're only going to be able to do army to army or high level swaps because they're in service or um, the country concerned, you know, we're going to end up having to do it at top level. It's not likely we're going to be able to buy some of those vehicles or do an exchange in the, as you might be able to with a private collector. So we're trying to acquire these all the time. And on that list, we had put an early war emergency measure vehicle, uh, something we were going to be able to put in our World War II, our forthcoming redisplay of our World War II hall. And uh, fortuitously, uh, on a website, up came this vehicle. It was literally put up on that morning. Absolute wonderful chance um, or fate. 
uh, I looked at that website and there and behold was this particular beaverette. Now it came from a collection that was put together many years ago, 60s, 70s, 80s, by a chap in Sussex called Cyril Groombridge. I remember as a youngster actually going along there and seeing some of these vehicles that he collected. He was one of those early chaps in the game collecting military vehicles. He had a fantastically interesting collection, everything from a Ford Model T uh, with a machine gun mounted on it, right the way through to much more modern vehicles. And uh, presumably at that time I went along, this was probably somewhere in one of the sheds. Um, Cyril sadly died a few years ago. His sons have been uh, sorting out what vehicles were left. Um, some had already been sold on. And this is one of the last remaining vehicles. And when we contacted the family, they were very kindly, um, the two sons and, and the, the widow were very pleased to see this vehicle come to the tank museum uh, and for our benefit, knocked a sizable chunk of money that was being asked for this vehicle off. So that's how we've actually acquired, for the first time in an awful long time, the Tank Museum, we've actually paid for buying a vehicle rather than trying to do a swap or uh, smoke and mirrors to try and get things. Sometimes as well, we, of course, were gifted things out the army system. Um, and that, I come back to that because for us, it's a really important point. To be a successful museum, we have to continue to collect. We prune the bush, as I sometimes call it, you know, to keep that plant of our collection healthy sometimes we've got things that it's just not worth keeping anymore they're beyond economic repair other times as i say we get a better example or one with a more significant history it's not just completeness if that is a vehicle that served in a certain campaign or we know who the driver was then obviously that adds a historical importance to the vehicle now we're really pleased therefore to be able to have acquired this and with your support and i bang on about this all the time um, it's really important that you carry on supporting us because that allows us, it gets us the money to allow us to do things like this. Now the plans for this Mark IV Beaverette, uh, it's all there, it's very complete, a bit rusty around the edges. We're going to use this as a project for our apprentices in the workshop. So kind of watch this space because we'll be able to report back on you how this vehicle comes back together, what we're going to do with it and... Uh, hopefully be able to run this vehicle before it goes in our World War II display. Um, so again, watch this space. And as I always say, thank you so much if you are supporting us. If not, if you like this type of thing, please do join something like our patron scheme because that means we can continue acquiring vehicles like this one.